Hello and welcome to Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we chat to industry experts to get a view on what's happening on the ground and indeed to learn about new trends emerging within the construction industry. This show is brought to you in partnership with Place Engage, a data-driven platform for more successful public consultation and community engagement for your next project. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Pat Mahoney, author of Rethinking Housing Options for Senior Citizens, Retirement Villages in Every Irish Community. Pat, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Carol. I'm very pleased to be with you. Um, Pat, you have certainly honed in on a problem that has really just in recent years been recognised as a looming problem for Ireland. But before we before we go any further, you might just share what is your idea and the principal idea of rethinking housing options for senior citizens? I suppose behind it all is that Research and indeed personal observation tells us that many older people, irrespective of their means, reside in relative isolation, even when they live in urban areas, in homes unsuited to their needs uh, that negatively impact on their quality of life. And the research tells us that very clearly. Besides, we know that many older people feel unsafe in their homes, and that's quite difficult for younger people to appreciate. And, and unsafe in their locality, in the urban area as much as in the rural area. And they find it difficult, if not impossible, to access the people and things that 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 appeal to them or that interest them. Uh, you know, only 47% of people over 75 drive regularly. And then, of course, kind of flowing on from that is that as these people become frail, their need for community-based Health care and home care often goes unmet and consequently many end up in expensive nursing homes uh, prematurely. I mean, that's established right across the globe, really. And of course, many, you see, you, you'll meet people who will say, but I'm not like that or my fam- my older relatives aren't like that. And that's the case. And many older people have family and friends close by, but mm-hmm. many do not. And they live lonely, uncomfortable and sadly fearful lives. And this is a situation that I think can easily and inexpensively, indeed, I would say cost neutrally, be rectified if we could only take example from what has been done in the Southern Hemisphere in particular, in Australia and New Zealand, and of course, the United States as well. OK, um, well, Pat, you might, I, I think that you won't find much challenge to the problem you're identifying there. I think most people can identify it. And yes, of course, there will be some uh, people who are lucky enough to be in a to be surrounded by family and, and friends and a greater level of support and maybe a higher level of financial comfort that they can that can buy in a certain amount of support. But for the majority of people, I think what you're saying will resonate um, you know, certainly. And so th- I, I don't think there's much contention around the problem. Uh, where where the conversation starts to maybe get lively is when we try to think of the solutions because there are so many different ideologies at play. So talk to me about some of the solutions that you've seen in other parts of the world that you feel might work for the Irish context. Well, I suppose for 50 years or more in Australia and New Zealand, you've had the retirement village concept, right? And, uh, you know, look, depending on, on the figures you read, and I was speaking to somebody else who's interested in the idea um this morning and he had a much lower figure but i'm quoting from the all party committee in the house of commons which did research and it concluded that 13 percent of people in new zealand and australia live in retirement villages by comparison one percent live in the united kingdom and in ireland look it's it's less than that Pat, I might just take you back a step to actually define what a retirement village is, because I think for most okay. people, they might have an idea, but that idea might be wholly inaccurate. OK, so OK, OK. Start okay. by telling us what you believe a retirement Absolutely. village is. Absolutely. Firstly, and the misunderstanding is oftentimes that they're seen as nursing homes, but retirement villages are absolutely not nursing homes. In fact, they're complete villages, residential communities, where people who are like they're just they're not villages in the sense that we understand villages, but residential community, where people who are hale and hearty enjoy independent living, feel secure, critical, and have access to quality assured healthcare, cultural experiences, hospitality, retail, nature, 
transport, recreation and other interests on their doorstep. That means they are at the center of communities, not on the edge of the town, not on the edge of the village, but at the very center. And, and in, Pat, would these people own their home? Because you said it's absolutely not okay. a retirement okay. home. So okay. what's the what's the they the would model? It depends. Just like in the wider society, you know, maybe something like seventy five percent own their own home. It it actually in Australia possibly probably is not owned so much as lease. Just like if you buy in an uh, buy a, a unit in an apartment, you follow uh, in an apartment block. So the law would say it's lease rather than than own in that sense, right? But you 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 purchase the lease and you sell when you leave it, uh, and 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 people just live independently, own door in their own purpose built homes designed to meet their needs as they grow frail, and furthermore. My model uh, places a big emphasis on ensuring that people who live in retirement villages are integrated into their local community and close to friends and interests. And when I say integrated into their local community, I'm also looking at the fact that we know that retired people have a, a wealth of skill and experience. And when you walk out the door of your workplace at 60, 65, or whatever the case may be, like your your capacity to use that to the benefit of society or to yourself is almost turned off, right? And I'm arguing that we one of the big challenges in the 21st century is going to be the way we tap into those skill that skill and experience to benefit the older person and to benefit the wider society. It could be in terms of part-time work. It could be in voluntary contribution uh, because there are many people, middle class people who have, uh, I suppose, comfortable income from their from their pensions and so on. You know, um, and I it, think that's it, huge. I, I think that's a great way to position, though, because actually over the last decade, I think we've become more aware that actually as we're losing people from the workforce, particularly when we have such a, a shortage in certain sectors of our workforce, we're seeing that skills walk out the door and I, only as recently as last week we saw changes within the guard of force to allow new guards come in at 50 because we know that there's such a talent shortage and um, that when we have skills and particularly for something like community uh, a guard within the community they need so much more than guard of training you need the life experience to be able to deal with people to read a situation and, and you know so so we're seeing that time and time again and in fact i remember almost a decade ago being involved with one of the local um enterprise boards in in a rural location that was actually trying to um, impart this almost mentoring exchange whereby um you would have people who were retiring helping startups um, but in exchange, they were learning about maybe new technologies and new business models coming in. And there was this great knowledge exchange. And I, I, you know, I've never followed up to see how that went, but I thought it was a super idea and it's something that we could definitely do with. And um, one of the things I'm, I'm very uh, interested in your proposal is because, yes, we have this looming challenge and I, I'm really interested from the model of people who have been renting and not necessarily homeowners either. But um, if we were to develop something like this, I know you've quoted stats of somewhere, uh, you know, maybe a potential pipeline of construction work of somewhere yeah. in the region of 25 billion, which is huge. But more importantly, you've talked about, you know, perhaps being able to free up housing for the next generation of first time buyers or people who yeah. wish to trade up and down, you know, maybe yeah. uh, as, as their family is growing. But you, that you could essentially free up several years worth of stock yeah. um, so th that makes me question the the blocks to delivery and blocks to delivery in Ireland r routinely come down to planning so do we know how, what this would be classified as in planning because you know obviously we've very different planning for student accommodation and for the private rented sector that's intended for rental so have you spoken to a planner have you gotten planning advice on this I have, and it depends on where the planner works uh, to some extent what they say about it. But 
But uh, what I've concluded is that there is a need for a specific class yeah. of uh, development to be defined and that we need a revision, even though they've just been issued, the new Section 28 guidelines to 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 local authorities around planning, right, to facilitate this because it is it is not a particular planning class and there is no specific provision for it. And I'm taking the view that if we want these communities communities to be at the center of communities then we have to do something in our planning processes to ensure that that happens it won't happen by chance you know it's, it's yeah. and 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 i would i would find planners who agree entirely and then i would find other planners maybe more in the local government area who kind of have this tendency of hands off you know, in Ireland, when it comes to planning, we're quite hands off by comparison with what other other countries are, particularly Australia. Australia will actually plan its new development totally, have the roads put in and everything like that, and then individuals come in and buy sites and build the houses. Right? I, I, I'm not to... sure. I'm not sure our listeners would agree that our planning process is hands off. I would say it is much more. Uh, 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 hands on on a project by project basis. So I think maybe the comparison to that, or, or the, the sorry, the antithesis to that might be a rules based system. Uh, might be what you're describing there, where essentially you have a set of rules and then you come in and you build under those rules, as opposed to having to look at everything on a project by project basis. Oh yes, yes, yes. So they that, they so they design the whole suburb, yeah. and then you come in and you it's all laid out. And you put the pieces in where they're supposed to go, and yeah. they fit. They fit and align with the neighbouring suburbs, so the roads run into one another rather than suddenly finding yourself flying along and going, oh, "I have to go back and come." You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's like yeah. like like a jigsaw, you know, to find your way around. So and and much less, um, I suppose, room then for challenges at any level. Because mm -hmm. you can only do it in accordance with the plan. Well, again, that's the beauty of a rules-based uh, planning yeah. regime, which unfortunately we don't have in Ireland. And, you know, what I, what I really like about um, the, the model you're proposing, although, again, I, I don't know how it would work in practice, but I like that your focus is not on the outskirts of town and um, but that actually it is about keeping people when, within their community and you know it it reminds me of um a, a case i dealt with very uh nearly two decades ago very early in my career um i met with a couple who had uh lived and worked in dublin six all their lives and their dream had always been to retire by the sea just over in dunleer so it, it doesn't sound like a huge stretch to go from Temple Oak to Dunleary. But for this particular couple, it was a big stretch for them to do this. Um, and, and it was what they had worked all their lives for. It was their retirement plan. It was their dream. And, and they did do that. They did achieve that. But unfortunately, within um, less than a year of moving, um, one of the couple passed away and immediately the remaining... Um, uh, the the remaining partner found that actually the vision was always to be there together, never alone. Yes, and actually yes. relocating at that stage of your life alone when there's so much happening yes, and yes. you don't even know the best dry cleaners to use locally. You don't even know the, the local amenities. Um, yes. And actually it's something that I, 20 years ago, so early in my career, I didn't know I was I was caught up in their dream and their vision in everything. And it was really a learning that stuck with me because I understood that when we make these dreams, we make them for the positions we're in in our life now, whether that's financial or romantic situation or, or attachment or where our families are or where our children and grandchildren are. And when something changes, it changes how we feel about a place. And this is where you know, a, a number of years ago, you'll probably remember that there was there was almost pressure being put on people who were described as rattling around in big homes and that they were almost 
being forced and, and guilted um, in some way as if they were stopping the next generation of first time buyers starting their families, which was incredibly unfair. And, you know, this whole concept of downsizing will only work, in my experience, for the people we've spoken to, the research that we've done. People will only downsize if they can stay within their own community. And, and we don't have that. We just don't have that uh, um, unless we're talking about individual infill sites, which you might be very lucky to get. We don't have that. So how do we get your model to work in towns where there might not be large areas for development, but that there might be pockets? I would say there are very few towns that haven't got areas that are in decline uh full of dereliction and so on and i think you know just looking at one particular subclass of building if you like and it's the convent the monastery the large presbytery which mightn't be a huge place but it's sitting on a nice chunk of land at the center of the town uh today even large pubs you know are closing uh and businesses are closing at the center of the town. So I'm saying these are the areas that should, in brownfield sites, uh, but we also need them in the greenfield, but in the brownfield, that should be um, zoned specifically for this kind of development. Um, and, and I think there are loads of them there. And I think they would regenerate the town centers, give them a life, they would allow for a recycling of buildings that will otherwise eventually be destroyed, but that bring history and heritage and some architectural, uh, what shall I say, uh, standard to the town, you know. Uh, so, I, I, you know, you might only retain the very front of it, but whatever, that yeah. we should. Um, genuinely, I, I, I think that's a super idea. And, you know, even as I was thinking in advance of our call, um, the, the town centre first policies that are that have been implemented over the last number of years. I mean, they have not been as successful. They haven't been no. em embraced in the way that we would have liked to. And no. a huge part of that is that we have a cultural need and want for houses over apartments, for front and back gardens, for for defensible space, for off street parking, and um, town centres don't suit um, modern life for a lot of people, and that's just the reality. No matter what way you dress it up, and there's no point in having a conversation around knowing that this is the more sustainable option for housing. We know that people at certain stages of their life just won't choose it. If they're at the start of raising a family, they want a garden, they want off-street parking, they want defensible space. And um, our, I, I know that's an ideology and policy that that is unsustainable, but there's a gap. There's a, there's a gap that needs to be bridged from what people want and what is the ideal in terms of sustainable, high-density, compact housing. And... We have we have a cultural gap to fill between those two things. And I genuinely believe your concept could actually be part of filling that gap, you know, particularly when you identify some of those spaces like the convents, like old HSE buildings. Um, you know, they're absolutely they're absolutely primed and ready. And it's interesting. Um, the LDA really started out with a remit for housing, under housing for all, and then went kind of very quickly into essentially just social housing and affordable housing. But actually, a model like this could be one of the solutions for affordable rental for people who have been long-term rental after they stop working, because we know that that is a, a, a particular mm -hmm. a, a particular category of senior housing that we're going to run into a challenge with people who are right now working and paying rent in the private sector, but that their mortgage is not going to cover private rental once no. they retire. No, um, but I think I think also, Carol, while we have done something half decent, that's I would no go, go no further in terms of uh, elder friendly housing for those in social housing. We have ignored completely homeowners. Yeah. 
And we have simply said you should downsize, but there's nothing to downsize to. Downsizing is not moving from a big house to a small house. Downsizing is moving to a house that's more appropriately located, more appropriately designed to cater to our needs as we grow frailer. And that is that is something that is not understood at all. And also the other side of it is that various local authorities have built uh, for social housing, for example, they have built maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten little chalets. I, I'd use that terminology, you know, but but they're they're on the edges of, of the community. And if we want to uh, have economies of scale to provide uh, communal uh, services, uh, then we have to have some size, right? And for example, the size of the retirement villages in Australia, the average, I think, is 110, if I remember correctly. Now, many of those are developed by large uh, corporations such as Stockland and Lindley's. They are two of the biggest operators in the business. Uh, but then... All the churches have them. The Return Servicemen's League, the RSL, have them. They're much smaller, right? And then there are mixed tenure, you know. So, but but economy of scale is something that has to be taken into account because we can then. I I I'll be quite honest. I was at a meeting in Dublin about this matter uh, one day this week, and I came back, and and I needed a physio session because I have a problem with. <laughs> with with my leg and um and i took in a copy of my book to the physio who i know and he said to me he said look pat he says i heard you on the radio he said but look he says it's an open and shut case this is absolutely critical and then he went to tell me about the time he's wasting and other providers of services to older people are wasting driving all over the country uh, to provide services, but he also said, and I would have seen this myself, and not only have I seen this myself, but I engaged, I sent a copy of my book to every counsellor in the country and engaged with a lot of them, and they would have said the same thing. And what he was saying, what the counsellors are saying, what I see is that there are large numbers of older people, many of them on their own, but couples as well, living in Ireland, in urban and rural Ireland, in homes that are totally unsuited to their needs, very uncomfortable. He he said to me, the conditions that these people are living in, he said, are terrible. He said, they're by and large are living in two rooms, the kitchen and the bedroom. And he said, in some cases, he'd see that they've even moved the bed into the kitchen, right? And the reason that, and, and they are living with a degree of fear about, being raided at night, very lonely, very isolated. And they live there and continue to live there because they don't think there's anything else for them. And they dread what is at the end of the road for them, which is the nursing home, right? And I'm saying we can provide something much better. I know you, you mentioned there about the couple that went to live in Seapoint or whatever it was, right? But um, I recall one woman saying in Australia that because in certainly there's a case made in Australia for people moving to retirement communities at an earlier rather than a later stage, right? Rather than having to leave your home when there's nothing else left for you but to leave your home, right? And that is shocking and terrible and an awful experience. But they would say, like, if you move earlier to a retirement village, then by the time you get frail or by the time you lose a partner, you have a network of friends and you have all these services well wrapped around you. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying, right? Absolutely. So, so leaving it to late mm -hmm. is probably not a great idea. And also, I suppose, with people as we grow old, and I'm growing old very quickly, um, we have to be realistic that I might have loved to have lived out in the bush uh, and fished in the Murray River. But like, as you get older, that is simply not an option anymore. And we have to be realistic. 
It doesn't mean that we can't do a thousand and one things that are hugely satisfying to us, but there is a need for realism. And I think the what would help there, because I, I, I say really that the whole idea is to provide with the retirement village is not to tell anybody they need to do anything because people have said to me, well, you're not going to tell me where to go. And I'm saying, I'm telling nobody what to do. What I would hope for is that we will build these communities that will be so attractive and so well-designed and so well-priced and have so many supporting services wrapped around them that those who need them will be attracted to go there. Yeah. and live full and independent lives for longer than they might have lived in other circumstances. And um, Pat, I, I don't think there's any argument against the ideal you're painting. I think it is what what many people will choose uh, if they could choose it indeed. I, and I think there possibly is maybe a bit of an urban rural divide here. Um, You know, it's much more difficult to get people in from a very rural setting into um a more urban, even if it's a small village. So I think that there's might be some cultural differences there, but I suppose I'm conscious that we've limited time today. And I'm really curious about the business model because um, I love new ideas. I love great ideas. Um, I, and I feel like we talk about planning being a hurdle to so many of the innovations that could really tackle some of the deep problems we have in housing. But I also see planning as a potential solution to tackle some of the, the re, these really embedded problems. But let's talk about the business model because everything needs to be financed. So even if you're talking about um, private homeowners who will sell their own private home and purchase one here, whether it's leasehold or freehold or, whatever, or, or indeed if they end up renting. Um, but the model, obviously, to understand the business model, say for developers who might be interested in a niche like this, you know, can you talk us through some of the models that you're aware of? Okay. The the impression I the distinct impression I'm getting from the developers that I've talked to is that this is an attractive proposition and something that they see the need for. However, they find themselves caught by virtue of the fact that the planning provisions do not facilitate it. And that's one step, one, one issue with it. The other issue is the difficulty in getting finance, right? Uh, and I think those two areas, like the planning issue is so simple. Look, it, it requires probably 200 words in uh, to be inserted into the Section 28 guidelines. The the plan the the funding then I think one of, you, as you're aware those who build apartment blocks also have issues with with attracting funding and had the REITs not come into Ireland notwithstanding all the criticism that we may make of them um, we wouldn't have any of those apartments either you know so what I would have thought would be that the government sh might be able to find its way to simply in the first instance underwriting on guaranteeing. Uh, the finance in order to facilitate uh, it being drawn down. Also, and, and looking at it the other way from the point of view of the individual resident, that uh, they could do the same with bridging finance, which is very difficult to get, so that I can sell my home here. I, I don't have to sell my home here until I have settled myself in to my new home in the yeah. retirement village. Right. So I think those are two pieces. But but in Australia, just maybe this might throw a little bit of light on it as well. Um, as I said, like there are whole piles of ways in which you can buy into the development. But one is to buy the lease. Right. And then uh, you, you sell it. Well, there are other costs and charges associated with ensuring that the, there's a in in Australia there would be a swimming pool in every in every um in 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 every retirement village but here in Ireland certainly there's potential for things like gyms and art rooms or craft rooms or meeting rooms or tv rooms or little libraries or reading rooms or gardens and you know all that kind of thing so um, I, I would think that um, 
so there is a, there are other charges in Australia. Those charges are approximately three percent of the price of the property when it is sold. So if my home in the retirement village is sold for four hundred thousand, and it's it's at the time that it's sold that it is applied. So that's three percent. That's 12,000 a year. If I live in the retirement village for 10 years, that's 120,000. So instead of whoever benefits from my estate getting the big 400,000, they get is a 280,000, right? Now, some people might say that's an awful lot of money. And I say, well, what value do we place, do we place on the quality of life? Yeah. You know, like, I think that's now other figures that I've seen are much less than that, but I think they're bearable, you know. Mm -hmm. And but, you know, it, I, I look, I absolutely agree with you, and and it's something that attitudes have changed, um, as the rules around fair deal have changed, because as we know, a fair deal was anything but fair, and the people resisted. They quite simply didn't use the scheme, so it didn't work as intended for the government because. Um, in my experience, good people will always find a way around bad policy and fair deal as it was introduced was bad policy. So people didn't use it and the government had to respond. And by the way, we've seen so many examples of that in terms of um, the city living uh, or living cities initiative. You know, so we know that when government introduces a scheme and it's not fully used, then they uh, they acknowledge it's not being fully used. Sometimes it takes longer than we would like and, and changes are made. But the point is, changes can be made. So in terms of, um, you know, uh, introducing a class of planning for these types of homes, that feels like a solvable problem. In terms of recognising a new tenure of home, that feels like a, a solvable problem in terms of, therefore, how you finance it. Because we've seen that done in the last two years with cost rental in Ireland. So we know that that can be done. Um, the, and in fact, in that case, the government looked to Vienna, looked at a model and, and thought about how that could work in an Irish context and made changes to make it relevant for the Irish context. But now it is working. It is starting the, the cost uh, cost rental homes. We're starting to see them being delivered at scale. So that was to address essentially affordable rental for a, a certain class of of or a certain uh, cohort in the marketplace. And I see your solution as being exactly that, how to address a particular problem for a particular sector of society. So we know that the these we know that these are solvable problems when there's an appetite to do it. So really what we need is the appetite to do it. You you mentioned that you've spoken to councillors and and senators and um, indeed local authorities where's the biggest point of resistance to getting started here well I, I wouldn't find great enthusiasm in local authorities um, and I'm not surprised at that um, but I think therefore the state has to do certain things in order to facilitate it happening Right. Uh, the first thing I would see, as I said, is is the zoning. I think there's a need for legislation to protect the interests of all involved in the retirement village uh, activity in Australia, for example, since the 90s. There is legislation in every state in the Commonwealth of Australia governing the operation of retirement villages. And only 10 years ago, approximately all this legislation was revised because there were some some uh, sharp practices emerging right and you know we've had to do the same when it comes to insurance and pensions and all the rest so it's only right that, uh, but but that is all we we could pull it straight down off the shelf you know we know what works we know what has been worked on and developed over a number of years then i think there probably is a need for some standards around what the now I, I think we have to be very careful not to lock in standards you know that are that are locked in for 25 years and 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 stymie progress I, mm -hmm. I but I I nevertheless I think we need standards you know that are that are reviewed on a regular basis or whatever the case may be um and then I think of course we need the incentivization 
for for both the the developer and the older person. Um, so that's how I would look. There's a lot more to it. I, I I acknowledge, but I think those are the core bits and pieces. You know. Yeah, and um, Pat, there's so much to think about there. You mentioned there um your book, so I would recommend to people that. Um, they can access your book for free on your website. So you might just share the details there. Retirementvillagesisland.ie, retirementvillagesisland.ie. But if anybody Googles Pat Omani, it'll take them to it. And and the book is uh, is there. They can print it out. Do it. If they want to, they can order a, a copy of it as well for me. But I didn't do this to make money. Uh, I, I did this because I think that it's something that hasn't been seen as a possibility by those who should be seeing it for want of a better description. I think we tend to be quite insular in Ireland and not kind of learn from abroad until sometimes it's too late. Or sometimes we jump on bandwagons that have run into trouble before we actually jump on them. Uh, but to me, this is it's a self-evident kind of development um, like just in Ireland at the moment, there's something like, I think, roughly 13 percent of the population who are uh, over 65 in Japan. Would you believe that that's 29 percent, 29 percent? We're heading there. But also in Japan, Japan sold more nappies to geriatrics than to for babies our children last year. Now that's a very sobering thought, but our world is getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, life expectancy of uh, a girl born at the moment is 105. Like that should put it in perspective. Our world is changing. We have to respond before it's too late. <laughs> so I think, I think it's urgent. I look, I, I think that's very compelling. I am um, again, I just don't think you'll run into any um, challenges in terms of people agreeing that with the problem. It's uh, almost trying to agree ideologically on the right solution and then how to remove the barriers to be able to do this. And I think it's one of those situations where we actually need the public and the private sector to work together in terms of a sustainable business model. But obviously, we need to remove systemic barriers like potentially planning um, and regulations there. But look, what I would recommend um, as a first step to people, even if they're not ready to go to the website and read the book, as a first step, think about how you want to live as you advance in years. And I think that in itself is quite a sobering exercise that might lead you to do a bit of um, inquiry that might lead you down the route of landing on the website and reading that book and seeing how that could be applied, not just for yourself, for your own family members, for the people in your community, but actually in the long term about shaping the kind of society we want to live in. So, Pat, thank you so much for taking the time to go through that with us. And thank you for taking the initiative to do this. Again, it's a problem that has increasingly been acknowledged and everybody agrees is a problem, but just not many people have actually sat down to try work through solutions and look at examples that have worked from overseas. So I genuinely appreciate you doing that and then making the effort to make sure that we know about it. So thank you so much. Um, thank, you. thank you. And that's all we've time for today. Um, that was Pat O'Mahony, author of Rethinking Housing Options for Senior Citizens, Retirement Villages in Every Irish Community. And again, you can go onto the website and read plenty of information around that. Lots of uh, interesting stats and a good a good place to start rethinking how we want to be living in the future. My thanks to show producer Katie Tallon and to the production team at Hear Me Roar Media on sound. And also thanks to Place Engage for making these conversations possible. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out all of the other real estate and construction shows on iProperty Radio. And thank you indeed for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of Breaking Ground on iProperty Radio.